Do you like aliens, UFOs, cryptids, and the supernatural? What about self-defecating humor? Uh, actually, it's self-deprecating humor. Well, you may both be right. Alien Theorist Theorizing is a comedy podcast that examines cases like Roswell, Bigfoot, Dyatlov Pass, or the Atacama Alien. Was that that little pickle baby that was found at Chili's? Uh, it was alien remains found in Chile. We also explore the minds of some of the UFO community's best. We talk crop circles with Freddie Silva. And we explore the current state of UFO disclosure. With my man, Richard Dolan. If any of these topics pique your interest, grab a beer and come hang out and theorize with some not-so-sober, like-minded weirdos. As we wade through the BS and get inspired by the possibilities. New episodes every Friday. Subscribe to Alien Theorist Theorizing free anywhere you find podcasts or go to alientheorists.com. It didn't listen to me. It walked out of the thicket. It turned around and looked at me. They looked up, and in this tree, there was a monkey man. And the monkey man jumped down out of the tree and started running away. And suddenly, they're right in front of the car. He slams on the brakes and manages to stop. And he's skidding because it's not quite, you know, um, gravelling. And for literally for about a second and a half, they just stood there because they don't know where to go. And you tell them panicking, you know, like roof dropping. Their, their, their face is like twitching. to Bigfoot Society, a podcast where we focus on cryptids, the strange and the unexplained of this world. If you've got a story or something weird to share, send an email over to me at bigfootsociety at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support this show, head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. And now on with the show. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got uh, the privilege of talking to a a new friend today. Uh, This is George from Oregon. Uh, and he's got a few uh, interesting encounters to share with us about uh, Bigfoot back in the uh, 1980s, I believe. But, George, how's it going today? Oh, it's going pretty good. Real fine. I was born in Climate Falls, Oregon. And our family, we are a fourth-generation McNair family in Oregon. And all of us... Uh, spend a lot of time hunting and fishing and doing that sort of stuff. Um, I went to Medford High School, graduated in 1965. Um, and what else here? Okay. Um, and I'm a landscape architect that lives in Coos Bay, Oregon. Uh, so, Let's start out. Uh, back, I'm just going to estimate the date. Uh, back in about 1980, my friend Bill and I, but he and I were wood cutting. Uh, we lived in Medford, Oregon at the time. And I had a big wood truck, and we drove north of Medford up towards a small logging town called Prospect, Oregon. And um, like I said, the town was small, and we were cutting wood, uh, I'd say, five miles from Prospect, uh, Oregon. And we were in a flat area where real tall Douglas fir trees were growing all over the place. And these trees get like 100 feet tall by six feet wide. And there's and there was huckleberry bushes uh, scattered about. It was flat. Uh, it was flat ground, and we decided to uh, just camp out on our. We just threw down a big tarp and laid our sleeping bags out. Um, 
and because we were so tired after cutting wood all day, we just had to get to sleep. Um, the moon was out that night, and so you could see uh, th across through the forest. You could see the bushes and stuff. And uh, anyway, about, you know, this is a mystery I still am not figuring out. At 2 in the morning, I'm sound asleep, and whatever happened, I don't know, but I snapped awake, and I looked, kind of propped up in my sleeping bag, and looked ahead about 50 feet, and so I'm looking, trying to clear my eyes, and there was a big, uh, uh, in front, 50 feet away, there was a big fallen tree that was about four feet thick and behind this tree was a fuzzy animal all i could see it was it was behind the tree kind of with its arms on the tree so all i could see was from the waist up and so i'm looking uh directly into its eyes I, i'm not afraid probably foolishly, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking, gee, that's a bear, uh, what I thought, and then I was thinking, uh, gee, bears have big, fuzzy, round ears. This thing had no visible ears, and then I knew, because I'd seen bears uh, before in the wild, one came down a hillside while I was fishing and kind of was going to chase after me and get my fish. So I knew what bears look like. And, and so, and this thing did not have a flat head like a bear. It kind of had a, a cone shaped head. Now it looked to me, it was, it looked, well, at the time I didn't think Bigfoot, um, I just, uh, I just looked at it, looked at it, and I would guess it was about maybe 300, 350 pounds. So in, in the Bigfoot world, that's a small one. Um, so we just kept staring. And um, anyway, I thought, well, I'll wake my partner, Bill, up. So I looked over, pushed on him, pushed on him. He wouldn't wake up. I looked back, and of course, the Bigfoot was gone. Uh, now, I didn't hear brush crackling, so it must have snuck off pretty well. So this is something to remember. When you see a Bigfoot, the minute you take your eyes off, they're going to disappear. So you mentioned this was in an area with a lot of huckleberry uh, plants, correct? Yeah. Uh -huh. Did you notice um, anything around the area where it looked like there were um, large, flattened areas that something big could have laid down in at all? It could have easily laid behind the huckleberry bushes. I'm pretty sure they were huckleberry. They were about five feet tall and five feet wide and thick. It could have laid behind them. You mean in terms of how it escaped? Um, I'm just curious. There's some places out there that are, uh, when you see certain plants, sometimes um, people have found like uh, nest sites. And I was just curious if if you remembered anything like that in that certain area. But just a, oh. just a left field question. So. Well, good question. I I didn't search the area. Okay. Um, yeah, we could have camped right to and right next to a nest site. So um, now, now that I think back on it, it took me about two weeks to realize what that was, because uh, about that time the Patterson Gimlin film was showing a lot, and so I suddenly realized it. Um, anyway, I I look back on it and uh, I. I have kind of a theory, I'll just make it quick. I think Bigfoots are closer to humans and they're very intelligent. 
in terms of wood savvy and protecting stuff. Uh, I think they're smart enough to know. Now, if this Bigfoot was really not friendly uh, and wanted to take me out for dinner, uh, I think they know that if two people are involved, the second person will be a witness. And the Bigfoots are smart enough to know that you don't leave a witness because they're gonna because the woods are gonna have search parties, the state police, helicopters. So, uh, so anyway, that's a theory I have, <laughs> and that's the reason why I'm here now because I have a partner. Because there are 411 cases where people just disappear, and there's and we don't know why. Okay. Uh, let's go to the, the, so quite a few years passed, and uh, anyway, there was a second, um, I would say a second uh, mystery encounter. As the years passed, I started reading more and more and got real interested. Uh, and by the way, Tom Powell's book, about Bigfoots, he's the author. I read that one and it's really good. And uh, and in that book, uh, he talked a little about uh, Bigfoots uh, that can, uh, apparently uh, they call it cloaking. So uh, anyway, I don't want to get too far in the paranormal stuff and have all the audiences just joking and laughing, but uh, the second time uh, we had moved to Coos Bay, Oregon, which uh, is on the Oregon coast, and South Coos Bay we have what's called the Elk River, and then you drive up the Elk River about 30 miles and there's a campground. So this is when I started basically researching Bigfoot, see if I could scare myself out to death, which is kind of what happened. So I drove up the Elk River to this deserted campground, and then I was searching around, and after a while it became dark, just pitch dark. And uh, so I'm, I'm on the road looking into the camp. And again, it's Oregon country has what are very tall trees. They're called Douglas fir. And, uh, and this campground was flat. And there were, again, there were bushes. So I'm looking in, in there and, uh, and I hear this odd bird call. I never heard a bird call like this, especially at night. Uh, and it sounded fake to me. Because uh, I've been, like I said, I, I, uh, uh, I'm 75 years old and I've been in the woods many times. So here this bird call comes and it sounds like it's about 100 feet from me. Uh, I can tell. It was about 100 feet. And I can't describe what it sounded like. It sounded like a cross between a, a, maybe a crow and a woodpecker or something. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot Society. We'll be right back after these messages. Progressive presents Adjusting to the Suburbs. It never dawned on me how much walking I used to do until I bought a house in the suburbs. Like when I'd say, I'm going for coffee. Of course I was walking. But now it's like three miles and no latte's worth that. I find myself inviting people on walks with me like it's a scheduled activity. This morning, my neighbor asked me what I'm doing, and I actually said, I'm going for a walk with Nancy. Anyway, when you save with Progressive by bundling your home and auto, that's the easy part of adjusting to the suburbs. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers. Need weekend plans? Check out what's happening in your local Lowe's. Weekending at Lowe's gives you and your family the opportunity to make us your weekend destination. Stop by for free workshops, events, and activities for everyone to enjoy. 
We're getting active with fun local events like our upcoming Lowe's Bucket Ball Challenge and Kids Workshop. Visit Lowe's.com slash events for our full event lineup. Count on Lowe's for all of your home improvement needs. And now, activities in your community with Weekending at Lowe's. And so, um, and then I'm, I just stood there. And about three minutes later, I hear the same bird call except it's in it's coming from the bush right in front of me <laughs> and i couldn't believe it because uh that was a matter of seconds that it moved from a hundred feet away and came in front of this bush and i'm standing right there looking in the bush it's real thick and i thought, oh boy uh, what happened here Maybe there was another one in the bush. I don't know. Or maybe it threw its voice. I've heard of them being paranormal. So uh, so anyway, it's pitch black again. I'm by myself. Didn't bring any guns. Um, and at the time, anyway, at the time I was a school teacher and I had to get back. So I just left it at that. I wasn't going to look in the bush, but something, it was just something weird. And it was perfect Bigfoot country. And if you look on, if you look on BFRO, go to, um, you go, it was in Curry County. You can see the Bigfoot report uh, that people write up. Okay, so that's the second one. Um, and that wasn't too scary. Now, the third one that's happened um, is this was near Coquille, Oregon, which is close to Coos Bay, Oregon, about 30 miles apart. And I'm guessing both of these incidences were in 2005 to 2010. I, Anyway, uh, I've kind of gotten a little more savvy, and so uh, I and it looked like a, an area where Bigfoots were. You kind of have to recognize areas, and so what I did is uh, I I took some uh, metal wire. And hooked some, hooked about seven apples and hung them from some trees that were about eight feet up. Uh, and my theory is this lets them know that you're friendly. Uh, and most of them. And so maybe they don't want to jump on you at night and take out a friendly human. Who knows? So anyway, uh, so I went back about a week later. Okay, so now I'm near Coquille, which is about hmm, 20 miles east of Coos Bay. It's uh, has the Coquille River running through it. It's a great place to drift boat and catch steelhead and salmon. Okay, so anyway, these apples had been hung, hung and they were there about a week. So I went back to check. And uh, and if I recall, most of the apples were there. So I hung around so long, it got pitch black again. Um, and my wife was with me this time. And so we're standing there, and I hear these faint whistles, like you'd hear a whistle, um, and then maybe 30 seconds, a minute would go by, and then you'd hear another one, and another one, and I knew that Bigfoots do this because I'd read about them. There are good books out there. Uh, one of them, you know, anyway. I, I had known previously, and I thought, gee, sure enough, this is happening. 
I couldn't believe it. I was looking up into the pitch black forest and something was whistling. And my, I said, Chris, my wife, do you hear that? And she goes, yeah, I hear that. I said, well, what do you think it is? And she said, oh, it's just kids up there. Oh, geez, no. Because we were in a dense forest and there was only one house that was several miles from where we were. So she thought they were kids playing um, out in the pitch black, black forest at night at night. I don't think she really wants, wanted to uh, know what that was. So I said, okay, well, maybe we better just go because who knows, or uh, maybe one of them's hungry. Uh, so I, I kind of evacuated her out of the area with me. And on the way back to the car, I looked up to where they were, and I saw some object pop up out of one of the bushes, uh, and then it kind of ducked back down. I thought, wow, okay. Uh, so... Um, so we kept, we just got in the car and we left. Um, George, so sorry, George. Yeah. I am going to, I am going to interject with a question. Um, when you saw, so you saw, you said an object pop up when you looked back up the hill, correct? Yeah. Did you see any details for that object? Uh, anything else that you can use to describe it at all? Well, it looked strange to me. Um, it kind of looked, uh, I could make out maybe a head, shoulders, but they were kind of illuminated and there was no illuminated light around. So that part has, has questions, I have questions about. Hmm. Uh, but I did see, I, and it wasn't clear. It was kind of a flash. Sure. But uh, so I wish it would have been more clear and better. Um, but anyway, that's what happened at that incident. Now, I've been wanting to get back to that area. Uh, and so I'm kind of looking for somebody to go with me. So if anybody knows of anyone close to Coquille Coos Bay, I would like a couple of partners um, to go up there and hang some apples and see what we find. Because Oh, and another thing, that same area that I'm talking about, um, I've been looking at uh, Bigfoot reports. And um, and this one guy uh, left his name, and he was camping up in that area, uh, out in the open. And he told me, uh, he called me last week and said while he was camping, he, uh, he heard an enormous roar, sounded like a Bigfoot roar, and scared he and his wife half to death. And another report came out of this area, same area. Uh, a, uh, a man and wife were driving uh, through this area up, up, a, up a mountain. And they, let's see, some rocks started to be thrown at them across the road. And my, his wife got out and looked up and heard branches cracking, and, I, and she said she saw a Bigfoot. So this area, I know, uh, has a clan of Bigfoots. But, of course, what we don't want are hunters in there trying to take a trophy. Uh, so anyway, if somebody gets in touch with me, uh, shall I give them my email address? 
So, uh, George, as we talked about uh, before, this is totally up to you if if you want. Because there's people that listen to this all over the place, especially in the Pacific Northwest. So if you want people to get in touch with you, uh, maybe you guys could, you know, you could give them some info about where to look, et cetera. You can definitely provide a contact right now. So G McNair 800 at gmail.com. So if you want to go researching, I'll, I'll take you but you got to be trustworthy because I don't want this area to be exposed because I'm pretty sure there's a clan of Bigfoots. Anybody interested in Bigfoot can join a forum. It's, I've been on the forum for years and years. Absolutely. It, uh, it's, uh, it, it's just called the Bigfoot Forum. So thank you much for listening thank you george yeah. for for allowing me to ask you some questions and for sharing your uh encounter stories uh and hopefully there's people listening that that area sounds familiar to you please get in touch with george so that uh maybe you guys can work together and uh find out some more yeah. information about sasquatch in that area and thank you george okay and thank you for having me on i'll see you on the Bigfoot form. I, I saw where you're posting. So you got keep it. it up. Thank you, George. And thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Bigfoot Society. If you like the show, please review and rate it five stars on iTunes. Hit the share button and send this episode to all your friends on social media. Subscribe to Bigfoot Society wherever you listen to podcasts. It doesn't cost a thing. Pick up a Bigfoot Society shirt or enamel pin over on our Etsy page and people will tell you all about their Bigfoot sightings when you wear it. At least that's what people tell us. That's what happens. If you'd like to become an official member of Bigfoot Society with a membership card, a community of like-minded individuals, and extra content each month, then please consider becoming a supporter of the podcast by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. Thanks for listening. Strange Familiars is a weekly podcast which explores the weird corners of the world. From Bigfoot and other cryptids to ghosts, UFOs, folklore, and forgotten history. We don't just talk to authors and researchers. We talk to actual witnesses of the paranormal. As he came in, the power flickered off again. I don't think I had ever been as scared of anything. It flickered back on, and he was right beside me. And he got really close to my face, and he said, stay away from things you don't understand. We don't just talk about haunted places and spooky forests. We go there, and we take the listeners with us. What? Did you see that? You saw that, right? Did you see something move there? Yeah. A flash. In the dark. Find Strange Familiars wherever you listen to podcasts or at strangefamiliars.com.